everyone. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Director of Compliance and Quality Assurance and Training for GraySquare. And I'm happy to launch this initial new content for our social media. Uh, this is our first vlogcast, and I'm very excited to have with us today a gentleman that I've known for over a decade. Name is Bill Lampton, PhD. He is the biz communication guy. He launched his professional career by teaching speech communication at the University of Georgia. And next, he spent 20 years in management at the vice presidential level. In 1997, he launched his company, Championship Communication. Bill has provided keynote speeches, communication consulting, and coaching for top tier clients, including Gillette, uh, Procter & Gamble, Ritz-Carlton Cancun, University of Georgia Athletic Association, Oceana Cruises, which is where we met each other, and British Columbia Legal Management Association, among others. His corporate coaching boosts sales, teamwork, customer service, media relations, and best of all, profits. Bill Lampton hosts a weekly radio show and video podcast interview show. So, Bill, welcome to our initial vlogcast here for Grayswear, and thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be on your initial broadcast, and what a kick for us to connect again. Last time was 2004. I was the enrichment lecturer uh, for Oceania Cruises, and you are the marvelous balladeer who entertained us throughout uh, that 11-day voyage. Yeah, that was, uh, that was quite a uh, blessed time in my life. I remember you coming on board, and uh, I got to introduce you, I believe. Yes, you did. And then you got to come to see our, our shows. I, was, I think I was the assistant cruise director on that, besides being a performer. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great life. Do you remember where we went on that cruise? Yes, it, uh, it was a standard route that was repeated quite often, uh, wasn't it? Uh, maybe the Bahamas, and, and uh, I think uh, I'm trying to think of the other places. Um, we did some cruises that were up in the uh, like the Mediterranean. Uh, we also did the, like the Baltic. Area. No, this was a Caribbean cruise. Okay, great, yeah. Always, always love those. Oceana was a tremendous cruise line. Those were beautiful ships, uh, great passengers, great series. So you were and great uh, entertainers. <laughs> well, well, we tried. So, anyways, uh, let's ask you some questions here. So the first thing I wanted to ask you: Can you tell us a little bit about how you got where you are today on life's journey? Chris, I believe it started when I was a freshman at a small college in Mississippi where I grew up, Millsaps College. I remember so well the introductory speech course, never guessing when I took it that I would be teaching that eventually myself one day at the University of Georgia. I was amazed in the speech course that if someone had an idea, if they organized it well, if they presented it energetically and convincingly, they could change somebody's opinion in 10 minutes and possibly even their behavior. At the same time, I was active in theater, so that got me even more interested in communication. As a history major, I started recognizing that all, and without exception, all of the great movements in history had someone at the forefront who was a powerful communicator, even if it was Mahatma Gandhi who said very little but founded the nonviolent resistance movement. And then so I earned, as you said, my doctorate in communication at Ohio University, a wonderful three years of my life doing that, taught at the University of Georgia. Then after I'd been teaching for a while, I guess I can say, I wondered if all that communication theory worked anywhere else. <laughs> so I went into management and spent 20 years there at the vice presidential level. Eventually, I started thinking, you know, I've seen so many mistakes in communication and management. I've, I've committed many of them myself. I've learned a lot about what to do and what not to do. So that prompted me in 1997 to form my company, Championship Communication. I became a keynote speaker at conferences, conventions, associations. Also, I became a consultant 
and a speech coach as well. You mentioned some of my topics, customer service, sales, management, teamwork, and all that, of course, leading to profits for a company. So that's a, a thumbnail overview. And I've been a full-time business consultant, communication consultant since 1997. Well, fantastic. That's uh, it's quite a life. You've been very blessed. And uh, it sounds like all those experiences have led you to where you are today. I'm, could you have imagined the social media revolution um, that we're in today that allows you know professionals like yourself to get such a large audience through something like Facebook or another media platform? It is astonishing. I can still remember in 1996, I was living in Dallas, Texas at the time, and my brother called me and said, do you have email? And I said, what's email? He said, electronic mail. I said, where do you get that? At the post office? I didn't know anything about it. Truly, I was one of those guys who, in my entire management career, had very little to do with technology. Like a lot of people, I was afraid of it. And so being a manager, I could delegate it. All of a sudden, when I became an entrepreneur, there was nobody to delegate it to. I was very fortunate. I I found a couple of um, wonderful mentors, guides, coaches who saw what was going to be happening in technology and how much it could help our communication, not just locally, but worldwide. I still go to them for training. And I would never have guessed that I would be producing videos, audios, interviewing people, uh, sending video clips. I think I have something like 400 videos on YouTube now. You could not have possibly persuaded me that I would ever become even comfortable with technology. The <laughs> fact is, it's now the most, um, to me, it's the most enjoyable part of what I do. Well, that's great. I mean, uh, I've seen your videos on Facebook. I, I will admit I haven't checked out your YouTube channel, but at the end of this uh, interview, please make sure you give us all that information. So you got some great, great content on Facebook that I know about that I enjoy watching. So Thank you. I, I try to, I, I tr in fact, my videos on YouTube recently, I've shaped them into shorter presentations. People used to watch 15 and 20 minute videos. The, the videos I try to produce twice a week now are two minutes in length. And of course, that way you can get them on Twitter as well. Yeah, sh short attention span now. Mm -hmm. Got to pack it in. <laughs> We've noticed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Let me ask you another question here. What was a lesson you learned early in life that stuck with you to this day? As happens with a lot of those lifelong lessons, Chris, this was a rather painful lesson. I was working in a warehouse in South Mississippi. And of course, in the summer, we were unloading trucks of, and, and railroad cars of, full of fertilizer and seed and feed. It was a very hot, demanding job. I remember one day a couple of the guys that I worked with said, Bill, we're going to lunch. Can you handle the place all right? Well, of course, I was 15 years old. I could handle anything. We all think that when we're 15. So the farmer backs his truck up to the loading ramp and hands me a slip of paper. And I quickly realize that I need to go get 10 sacks of fertilizer for him. Those things weigh 100 pounds each. Now, the logical way to do it would be to load five on one, uh, what we call a little dolly, and take it out there. But no, I was very brash, and so I put all 10 on there, took them out there, unloaded them, threw them into the back of his pickup truck. And he never said a word while I was doing it. And then he said, Sonny, you got to take all those back. And I said, what in the heck do you mean I got to take all of them back? He said, look and listen next time when somebody gives you an order. I didn't say I wanted 10 sacks of fertilizer. I said I wanted 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so I had gone through that entire laborious, almost back-breaking, uh, full of sweat exercise to learn a valuable lesson. And that is listen carefully when somebody gives you instructions. He said to me as he was about to leave, Sonny, you might hate me right now, 
but I bet you'll remember this. And he was right. So that was a lesson that has stuck with me. And Chris, that's one reason in every seminar and every speech and in many of my articles, I stress the importance of listening in communication, whether it's personal or whether it's business. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> a tough lesson. Yeah, I, I remember doing some manual labor when I was in my teen years, and uh, that, that that fertilizer I actually worked for a um, a guy who did landscaping with a big hydro seeding truck, and those those bags of seed and fertilizer were were heavy. <laughs> so I can uh, I totally appreciate uh, the thousand pounds that you put in the back of his truck, <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to get back out of the truck. That's amazing. Yeah. That, that makes it even better. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so here's one for you. If you could recommend one book to somebody who's in their 20s now, what would it be and why? I can answer that very quickly because it's a book that has meant a lot to me, to people that I recommend it to. And that's Shad Helmstetter's book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. Mm -hmm. This has been a bestseller for a long time with very good reason. His theme in the book is that we shape our lives by our self-talk so that if we get up in the morning and we say, oh, what a lousy day this is going to be, we're right, <laughs> it will be. And if we say, I'm clumsy, we probably will become clumsy. All successful people have recognized that the power of our self-talk directs and shapes our destiny. And the fortunate thing is we are in control of that. We can decide. Uh, a motivational speech that I've given and that I love to give is called always push the up button. I say life is like an elevator. Every morning when you get out of your bed, don't imagine that you're in your bedroom and your comfortable house. Imagine you're in an elevator. You've got two buttons there you can select from. If you push the down button, Work is going, going to be pretty darn tough. Your family life might be, you'll feel bad all day long. But if you push that up button, so I highly recommend Shad Helmstetter's what, to, what Do You Say? What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. Very valuable. I think that's a brilliant recommendation. I remember, I, I believe I read that years ago when I first got into like multi level marketing. Yes, uh, into sales stuff. You know, that's one of one of the big hitters there, and that is so valuable today, especially in this social media world, where you know you post something on Facebook or Instagram or one of those sites, and people will just criticize you, condemn you, just pick apart every little thing you do. Especially if it's politics. Yeah, yeah. Especially if it's politics. I never do that. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't either. No. But, you know, and I was, I was listening to a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Hyatt recently. I love his works. He's a um, behavioral psychologist, I believe. He works in New York, I think at Columbia. And he does a lot of work about uh, how modern communication can be, on, especially on social media, can be so harmful to the adolescents. And he talks about how you shouldn't have your children on social media, um, you know, before the age of 11 or so. And then you really, you shouldn't have, they shouldn't have a Facebook page. They shouldn't have these social media accounts. It's okay to teach them how to communicate using a phone, uh, you know, because that's how we communicate nowadays, but to really protect children uh, and I, I see that, you know, I have, um, I'm lucky to have an 11 year old daughter now through marriage uh, to my wife, Ada, and, and she's in, uh, she, they're both in Columbia still as we work through immigration. Um, but we're very careful with what we allow her to see online. And that's with, great. Yeah, you got it. You got to be careful. And, and I think that's the flip side of the, of the Shad Helmsteller. If you're not building yourself up, inside with with positive thoughts and pressing that up button like you said you can be overwhelmed and destroyed psychologically by so many people out there who just 
want to tear you down. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a crazy time we live in. So that's a great, great book for advice. Uh, it goes back to what Henry Ford is famous for saying. If you think you can or you can't, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Either true. way. Yeah, very, very true. So tell us, uh, you recommended that book, but what are you reading today? I'm in the, in the last few pages of a book that I'd heard about for quite a while. I'd seen quoted, and I thought, well, if this book is, is that widely accepted, there must be some substance to it. So a few days ago, I started reading this book, and I'll read you the full title, Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. Oh, yeah. And the subtitle is How Great Leaders Inspire Everyone to Take Action. Looking on Amazon, I thought about posting a review of this book, but then I noticed there were 2,900 reviews already. And then I looked at, I listened to his TEDx talk, and it's rather amazing when somebody would get a million people listening to watching their TEDx talk. Chris Hiss has had 48 million views. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just astounding. So that book, as I read it, and I think people like you and your company who are in marketing, it's so valuable because he says so many of us stress the how to do something and the what we do, but people really want to know why. And the reason they want to know why is because if they like what we're feeling and it's what they're feeling, then some of the other might not matter. And they might choose our company or our consulting service over someone else who has maybe more of a pedigree and maybe more clients, more of a resume built up. And, and this book has captured me. And I, I think of from now on when I look at posting my website or and, and so I just did an article uh, yesterday and I wrote why I help companies create a crisis communication plan. Now, in the past, I might have said something like seven steps to a good crisis communication plan, but people need to know why. They don't care about the seven steps until they realize why they need it. Great book. Yeah, that's also a Dave Ramsey recommendation. He's, he's talked about that. Quite yes. Often. And um, I, I do have that on my bookshelf. I think I opened it and read part of it. And then I, you know, I kind of, I do that with several books and then I find one and dig into it. So I need to get through that. So I appreciate that recommendation personally. It reminds me of a saying that I had when I first got into direct sales. One of the managers that we brought on board, he would do a presentation to new hires and he, he would say if your why doesn't make you cry it's not big enough ah that's fabulous that's yeah. fabulous and i i i've always remembered that because you know if you're if you're in sales especially in like direct sales where you're going door to door or even in a like a big box location like a walmart or a target or working at a fair or just somewhere where you're interacting with people it's very easily to be discouraged. And as we all know, sale, uh, sales is a numbers game. So you have to keep that bigger picture in line. You have to know, or in mind, you have to know what your why is. And if it is big enough, you will put up with a lot of unpleasant people and a lot of unpleasant experiences to get to your why. And, and you think that behind so many of their, those no's, there are going to be some yeses. That's yeah, very true, very true, and uh, that's why I'm here today, and uh, I'm sure you as well. Um, a couple other questions here before we go. Recently, you posted a video on your Facebook page about simplifying language, and why do you think that's so important for communication? It's important because uh, we're trying to get across information and possibly inspiration. Our goal is not to impress. I go back to my freshman year at Millsaps College that I mentioned. I remember so well in English class, and this probably happened in a lot of freshman English classes, we were given a list of probably 300 words that we had to learn the definition of. 
I, if it, it, that was good from the standpoint of reading and learning. It's okay to have a sizable vocabulary so that you can read some works that might be a little difficult otherwise. But for our conversations, for our meetings, for our sales, for all other interactions, we need to remember that it's, it's uh, vital to that old saying, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. I remember, uh, you, you may not be familiar with a, a novelist from a long time ago, Somerset Maugham. Somerset Maugham said that when he started out, he made a notebook and he put in there all the, the fancy words that he thought he would one day use. He even said his favorite word was Mesopotamia. <laughs> it just seemed to have a good sound to it late in his career. He looked at that notebook. He had never used any of those words. And another famed novelist, James Mishner, said, our job is not to use extraordinary words. Our job is to use ordinary words to accomplish extraordinary meaning. I love that. That's great, yeah. And uh, if you do look at Bill's Facebook page and you do find his posting about that, I did have a rather pithy comeback. So. Um, you can you can try to find that on your own. <laughs> I think I tried to pull out as many big words as possible and put them in my in the reply. <laughs> you did well. You did well. That's so true, though. Yeah, and it makes no sense to use big words that people are not going to understand just to try to impress them. It's uh, yeah, and it, it does the opposite of impressing. It it makes you uh, look like a snob. It keeps you distant from people instead of drawing them closer. Yeah, what they, what they want is say it simply and say it directly. And that's what's going to impress me. Yes, exactly. That, and that ties into also um, the 80-20 principle, Richard, Richard um, Coach, I think that's his name. Um, business guy, he worked with Bill. Pareto, Bates. wasn't that? Was that Pareto? Pareto principle. And yes. talked about how he wrote a book on 80-20 management. And one of those, I think it's lesson number four or five of the 10 is simplification and um, really trying to make the complex simple to, uh, to have success in management. So good stuff. Make sure you guys try to find that on Bill's Facebook page. So one more question for you here. Uh, this is the last one that I threw at you and um, I thought it was interesting. If you could host a dinner party with anyone alive today, are there, who are the four or five extraordinary people you would invite and why? And um, this, we are assuming that your wife would be there because she's extraordinary, but who, who would you invite? That's what she would assume too. Uh, Chris, I, that, that's fairly easy for me to answer. The, the number one guest would be Gary Player, because to me, he has been one of those people in the world of sports who's been a great ambassador for the game for athletics. He's been a, an extremely wholesome guy. I had the privilege of interviewing Gary Player once when I co-hosted a PGA golf tournament. He was a grand interview. I've always admired him. A second one is somebody that won't surprise you because you've seen him mention him. I would love to have Engelbert Humperdinck at my dinner. I first saw Engelbert around 1970 when he had just hit it big. At 83, he's still touring. And he has, to me, uh, some of the greatest ballads that were ever recorded. Uh, many people don't know that a lot of those ballads started out as country music songs, but he turned them into romantic ballads. Then a third person that I would invite would be Mitzi Gaynor. Mitzi Gaynor may not be known to a lot of people today, but she was Nellie Forbush in South Pacific. She's 87 years old now. About a month ago, maybe a little longer, uh, I connected with Mitzi on Twitter, and she will answer your tweets. She's an amazing person, uh, was a versatile performer for decades, uh, one of those unusual people also in Hollywood or showbiz who was married to the same person for, I believe it was 54 years until his death. And she, she was just always so vibrant. A couple of others would be Joseph Michelli. Joseph Michelli has written so many books about what he calls the customer experience. He's written about Starbucks, Ritz-Carlton, Mercedes-Benz. 
uh, Zappos and others, and I had the privilege of interviewing him on a Zoom broadcast, just as we're doing. Great guy, extremely personable. And then let's see if that covers the list. One other I would definitely put is Colonel Lee Ellis. Colonel Lee Ellis grew up in Georgia. He was a fighter pilot in the Vietnam War, was shot down, was held captive for five and a half years in North Vietnam. And along with uh, Senator John McCain, who was also in that camp, and every one of those kept their integrity, would not tell any secrets. I had the great privilege of coaching Colonel Lee Ellis when he decided to launch a speaking career several years back. Since then, he's authored three or four books. He is a wonderful, genuine guy. And if you want to talk about a patriot, that's the guy. Wouldn't those five make a grand dinner table? They certainly would. And uh, just all the years of experience and all the, you know, just the life lives they led, that'd be fascinating. If you do pull that off, be sure to invite me. I'd love to come attend and uh, listen to all their tales. So clean. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, it has been a, a truly a pleasure to have you as the first vlog cast. And, uh, you know, I thank you for, um, telling me about zoom cause I wasn't sure the best format. I think this one works well. Before, yes. <laughs> before we go, can you tell everybody the best way to find you on Facebook or YouTube or other, other areas? I think probably the simplest would be to give my uh, website. I'm known as the Biz Communication Guy, B-I-Z. So logically, my website is bizcommunicationguy.com. I'm on Twitter as Doc Lampton. I'm on uh, LinkedIn as Bill Lampton. I'm on Facebook as Bill Lampton, and I have a business page there, Bill Lampton PhD, the uh, Championship Communication. I welcome people who want to connect with me, and of course, those who would like to discuss their communication problems and challenges and learn how I can help them solve them. My phone is 678 316 four three zero zero chris a wonderful privilege to reconnect with you and we're going to have some phone conversations to do some more catching up congratulations on all that you have achieved in life and in your personal life as well well thank you so much bill and i hope you have a great day down there in georgia for those watching we'll put bill's links into the uh, into the description page of the blogcast that will be on Gray Square, uh, Gray Square's Facebook page. And thank you, Bill. Have a great day. I'd still like to hear your Broadway medley again, and I've got your CD. I play it often. <laughs> okay, we'll do that on uh, we'll do that on your blogcast. Uh, <laughs> All right, sir. Have a great day. Thank you.